Уважаемые участники, добрый день еще раз. Мы начинаем Dear наш... participants, good afternoon again. We're starting our webinar, which is all about nurse leadership in palliative care today. And while our participants from everywhere across the world, they're bringing, coming and starting very slowly, I welcome everybody to introduce themselves in the chat. You, what you can do, you can write your name, where you come from, the organization that you represent. I think it's going to be super helpful. Uh, you can do that in any language and we'll commence very shortly. Uh, for the time being, you can use this opportunity to introduce yourselves, uh, network, learn more about each other and see who we've got coming here today with us. Еще раз хотел бы напомнить, что вебинар проходит... Once again, I'd like to make a kind reminder that we have two languages. It's in English and in Russian. In order to choose the language that's convenient for you today, please find the icon of a globe here. It's in the lower panel of Zoom, and you can choose the convenient language that can be Russian or English for today. Uh... Спасибо большое тем, кто представляет. Thank you very much for those who introduced themselves in the chat. I can see we have colleagues from Malaysia, colleagues from the Netherlands, from the UK, from Denmark, from Finland, of course. This is our an honorable speaker. Okay, UK, South Korea. Welcome, everybody. We are so glad to see all of you. And thank you so very much for your attention to this topic. It's called nurse leadership. It's an extremely important topic, and we'll be focusing on it today. Greetings to Croatia, of course, Australia, Georgia, Tbilisi. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad to see all of you. From Armenia, of course, greetings to, from all of us. My dear friends and colleagues, I'm absolutely happy if you continue introducing yourselves. You learn about each other, you learn about the new colleagues, and maybe networking a little bit. But we'll begin. We'll begin with our webinar. And I'd like to say that the topic of today is nurse leadership. This is an extremely important and I'd say endless topic and we'll have our today's speakers who will help us to dive deeper into the topic. I'll introduce them in just a couple of minutes. For now, I'd like to say a few words because I see a lot of new people in the chat, a lot of new people in our uh, Zoom list. And I'd like to use this opportunity to say a few words about PACE, about ourselves, about who we are. Because perhaps you have not heard about us or you don't know at all. So the Foundation for Palliative Care Education, in a shorter version, is called PACE. It's a UK-based organization. And it's the organization that operates in Central Asia, the Caucasus, Eastern Europe, and Baltic countries. Our main goal is to support professionals, support leaders through knowledge exchange through community members exchange in order to develop palliative care in their respective countries and regions and this is the most important priority because we believe in people and we believe that people are the most important um, key asset of the 21st century and that's why we would like to invest into people so just a second uh, you will see a link to our webpage haze.org.uk and in this web page, in the publication section, you'll be able to learn about our webinars, about our digest, about other materials we have. They are all targeting the very wide audience from different countries across the world. I'd like to also introduce myself. My name is Roman Sklotsky, and together with me, I have a big pace team. Thank you very much, colleagues, for being here with me today. We are very happy that today we're able to Thanks to our speakers, give a better look at this very important topic. It's a very broad topic as well called nurse leadership. I've said we have materials that are targeting the widest um, audience, but we also do have 
some very some very niche material, some services and products that are targeting the areas specifically where PACE works, Central Asia, the Caucasus, Eastern Europe, and the Baltic countries. For instance, we have a joint closed chat in a network called Telegram, a chat of palliative care specialists, those who are in our countries of presence, and you, you would like to join this chat, of course, you'll also see in our Zoom chat, there will be a link to the Google form if you would like to apply. There was just a very quick Google form that you need to fill in and will definitely connect you to our chat. Apart from that, very recently, we have started a grant program. This is so-called Palliative Care Professional Mobility Grants from the countries of presence again, from Central Asia, the Caucasus, Eastern Europe and Baltic countries. If you want to have the application submitted, you have uh, the deadline till the 20th of February. You feel free to submit. The page is there as well, available for you in the Zoom chat if you're interested. Feel free to ask questions, apply, and we'll be super happy to have you on board. Again, this is our web page, just for those who might have missed. You can see the link in our Zoom chat as well. And if you scroll from the main page, base.org.uk, you'll have a newsletter opportunity there if you're interested. It's for everybody, not only for the representatives of our countries of presence, but for people from all over the world. I'd like to say a few words about languages again, and I see we have new participants coming, and perhaps for some it might be the first time when they are seeing this simultaneous interpretation of functionality. We have two languages today, English and Russian, in this countries of presence for PACE, um, of PACE. Palliative care professionals usually speak either English or Russian as their professional languages, so that is why we have these two languages uh, in our webinar. And in order to choose the convenient language, please find this little icon called globe, or that looks like a globe actually, and choose the convenient language. Please feel free to use the language that is uh, comfortable for you today. We'll also have an opportunity to ask questions. Unfortunately, we won't be able to do it verbally. So um, there will be only a chance to do that in the written form. It's in Zoom. There is the so Q&A section in the Zoom um, panel. And we'll ask the most interesting questions if we have too many, of course. You are absolutely welcome to comment, make some, um, leave some opinions, don't hesitate to use the chat for that. There is an opportunity and we'll be happy to see your comments and opinions. And it's important to welcome and introduce the speakers uh, and the interpreters. Anna Kmaiva and Chris Roppelt, those are our interpreters today and thank you very much for supporting us. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce the honorable speakers for today who found their time and uh, they are happy to share their expertise today. Thank you so very much again. Uh, I deeply appreciate that. Our first speaker will be uh, Dr. Julie Ling. Dr. Julie Ling is from Ireland, but in fact, she works globally and across all Europe. Uh, so Dr. Ling is the CEO of the European Association for Palliative Care. She is also a consultant technical officer, palliative care at World Health Organization Europe. And as we can see in the slide, there is a quote from Dr. Ling, which um, it seems like it's a little bit far-fetched from the nurse leadership topic. The quote might look like it's a bit distanced from this, but in fact, this is a reference to this huge experience of Dr. Ling in pediatric palliative care. Uh, Dr. Ling has devoted a huge part of her professional life to that topic, and she has been and is still developing palliative care in Ireland. And today uh, she will be speaking, of course, as a part of the World Health Organization Europe. Uh, being a nurse as her vacation and her background, Dr. Ling understands very well about the importance of nurse leadership in palliative care. So thank you very much, Dr. Ling, for being with us today. And I'd like to introduce my, our other speaker. This is Dr. Mina Höcke from Finland. Dr. Höcke, she's a certified registered nurse 
She has a PhD in nursing sciences. She's also a senior advisor at Diakonia University of Applied Sciences in Finland. She's also a project manager in Oulu University Hospital and a board member in European Association for Palliative Care. And Dr. Hoka is the person with an extremely interesting professional trajectory. Just as well as Dr. Ling, she's a certified registered nurse. She has a professional background. And in my personal opinion, in our opinion, she has done a great input into the rethinking of the nursing uh, role and especially um, has developed this uh, palliative care system in Finland, focusing on the role of nurses. So thank you, Dr. Hoka, for being with us today from Finland. Finally, last but not least, I'll say a few words about how we organize our webinar today. In the first part, Dr. Ling will share, I'd say, some broad understandings. She'll speak about the conceptual model of how we develop palliative care. She'll speak about uh, what the nurse leadership is and how we understand this, how leadership is different from management and how all of this relates to palliative care. By the way, while I'm introducing a few words about the um, administrative issues in the webinar, it would be really nice if you leave a comment in our chat, either plus if you have ever heard of the notion nurse leadership, if you are familiar with that, if this is in your discourse, and you can just leave a minus if this is something new and unknown to you. So once again, leave a plus if this is something uh, familiar and you understand that concept, you can leave a plus. Um, or you can also leave a minus if this is something new and unfamiliar and if you maybe don't even know how it translates nicely into this uh, into your language. It will be nice for us to understand if this um, notion, if this concept, if this uh, collocation is known in your language, in your background. After the performance of Dr. Ling, we'll have 10 minutes for Q&A. I'll remind that we have a special panel on Zoom, Q&A panel, which you can click and leave your questions there in any language. In the second part of the webinar, Dr. Um, Hoko, she will share her experience. She will speak about the skills that are important from, that, that are important for nurses um, she will also speak about details and nuances of how she developed the focus on nursing in palliative care in Finland. And she will definitely share how she managed to integrate different skills that she'll be speaking about into the palliative uh, nurses training and development. That would be very interesting, I'm sure, to learn for your future as well, dear guests and participants. And after Dr. Hoka's performance, we'll have 10 more minutes to answer your questions. The time is unfortunately limited. That's why I will try to um, use the most of the time we have, but we'll be selecting the most relevant questions. And in order for you to feel excited about all of this, it's important to exchange comments with each other. You can absolutely do that in the chat of Zoom. There are special reply sections for the comments. And I now like to yield the floor to Dr. Ling. I would like to ask you to make sure that you are in English language. Uh, if that's the case, then I'll yield the floor to you and I'll stop my um, screen sharing. So good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much uh, for that um, lovely introduction. Um, so you can see from the slide, I've been the CEO of the European Association now for the last nine years. And for the last two and a half years, I've been working as a consultant with the WHO European office. Um, and so I've visited many countries uh, that are different stages of development of palliative care. So you can see my title and why is it in three different colors? I suppose it's because it's really that I'm going to talk about three different things. What is palliative care? A little bit about nursing. And then I was going to talk about leadership and bring it all together. So um, I was very pleased to see that many of you are in, in the chat were saying that you know about nursing leadership. I think knowing about it and it being a reality can be very different. So hopefully by the end of this talk, we can um, perhaps pull all three things together and you'll feel um, perhaps even if you don't feel like a leader, you might by the end of the talk. 
So what is palliative care? And for this, I've stolen a picture from our photo competition from um, the, the European Association for Palliative Care. And I think this gives a whole new look to what palliative care is rather than just hands holding hands. We see here two patients holding hands. And this, as we have a much uh, larger aging population and people are living longer with um, non-communicable diseases and chronic conditions, we see people living into very old age. And in this circumstance, you can see this is two people receiving palliative care at the same time. So just to be sure we're all talking about the same thing when we say palliative care, which I sometimes think is an issue that we don't always mean the same thing. Um, so it's for patients with life threatening illnesses in their families. So it can be any condition, any diagnosis. Uh, it can be given in many locations. So homes, health centers, hospitals, hospices. Some countries have hospices and others don't. Uh, it improves quality of life. And I think of everything on this slide, that's the thing that we really focus on most, that we add value in that we help to improve quality of life. It benefits health systems um, by reducing unnecessary hospital admissions. But I would also argue it benefits patients who don't undergo unnecessary uh, tests and treatment as well. So that's um, something that policymakers often like to hear. Um, it relieves physical, psychosocial and spiritual suffering. And of course, we look at the person as a whole and we look at them and um, try and treat each of their symptoms um, in whatever way we can to improve their quality of life. Um, and it can be done by many types of healthcare professionals. So it's not just doctors and nurses. Uh, we also include uh, volunteers and the whole multidisciplinary team in the care of people with palliative care needs. So this is the little boring bit for most people, but this is um, this is a World Health Assembly resolution. So what does that mean? What does it mean to people who are working clinically or on the ground? So in 2014, this resolution was passed and by all countries globally. So they undertook to strengthen palliative care as part of universal health coverage. So that really is the this this document was a landmark document for palliative care. It put us on the map, if you will, to say that, you know, palliative care should be part of the care of all patients who need it. And this was signed up to. So obviously it's 10 years since the resolution now in 2024. Uh, and it's probably worth reflecting on that. But that's a different talk. So evidence suggests, so this is broad evidence, as you many of you will know in the literature, um, palliative care improves patient and caregivers quality of life, uh, decreases symptoms, increases opportunities of patients to, ch to choose to die in their, lo their location of choice. For many of us, that would be home. Um, and for others, that's not where people want to die, but we have to be able to be responsive to that. And also that palliative care is cost effective. Dr. Lin, I would like to apologize and interrupt you for a second. Unfortunately, we see the messages from our participants where they say that they do not see the slides in a full screen mode. And what they see is like a, a partial slide that you are presenting oh, and, and okay, the other okay, slides okay. which are only now? partly visible. Is that Yes, now that's so much better. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry for interrupting you. Sorry about that. No, I'm sorry, everyone. It's uh, two screens. OK, so basically um, palliative care is an inter interdisciplinary speciality or multidisciplinary speciality involves a wide range of services and professionals, ideally. And of course, this is not the case in lots of countries. This is not possible or realistic, but it is not a unidisciplinary speciality. So one person, it's not possible for them to meet the needs of, of all the needs of a, of a person uh, with a life limiting or life uh, threatening condition. So ideally, it should be provided by an interdisciplinary team and provide rehabilitation uh, as part of palliative care. And that's a really important um, part of what we do. So this model is um, the World Health, World Health Organization um, has um, developed a um, model of palliative care. So these are the six key components. So we need to empower communities and people. So that's 
do people know what palliative care is? Do they know how to ask for it? Uh, do we provide support in the community? Do we talk about death and dying? We need health policies. That's the bit that we need to underpin and as the foundations of developing palliative care. We need evidence to support what we do every day. And that's really important so that we can provide evidence-based care, best practice to patients. That includes the use of essential medicines. So there are issues in some parts of the European region with access to essential medicines, such as opioids and certainly um, morphine, uh, oral morphine is still the strong opioid of choice, but still we have a lot of issues around the region where perhaps people can't access that for people with palliative care needs. Um, in order to uh, enhance palliative care, we need education and training. It needs to be included in the undergraduate education of all healthcare professionals. Um, and then obviously the roof is that we provide really good palliative care integrated into health services. And as with all things in palliative care, um, the patients and their families are at the very heart of everything we do. So now I'm moving on to nursing. So nursing, so this is actually a book that I had as a child, uh, I tell you my age, It's in. It's it, this is written in the 1960s. And this was, um, so you can see the role of a nurse is to look after people who are ill and to do what the doctors tell you to do and to help the patients to get better. And nurses carry out doctor's orders and care for patients. But nursing has changed significantly over the last 50 years. And so I think we need to think about what that role is and how and why it really palliative care is such an opportunity for nurses to develop as leaders and as independent practitioners. So nursing globally is in quite a difficult situation. So we have a shortfall of nearly six million nurses. It's the largest occupational group, predominantly female. Um, the greatest deficit of nurses in low middle income countries, there is a brain drain where people are moving to work in countries where they can earn more money. Um, and then we have 80% of the nurses working uh, um, in, in high income countries. So obviously this is causing problems in the gaps left behind, but um, even in Western Europe and the United States, there is still an enormous shortfall of nurses. So we're a really prized commodity. That's what we should understand. So nurses account for 62% um, of, of all health professionals in the WHO European region, nearly 90% are women, and we're the largest part of the health and, and care workforce. And that's the caring workforce. So this is not just nurses, but also healthcare assistants and people for providing support in healthcare. Um, so the Director General of the WHO globally, Dr. Tedros, he, he is quoted as saying that nurses are the backbone of the health system, but actually we know that there's still a lot of issues with nursing globally and we need to start looking at those. So nurses, as I said, are predominantly female. They, uh, there's a huge pay gap, you know, with our male colleagues and there's just discrimination in promotion and leadership roles and in decision making. And this all comes from a document, which I can show you here, which is talking about strengthening nursing and promoting nurse leadership um, because we will have a big shortfall in healthcare. We know populations are aging, as I said earlier. And of course, that means that there's a greater need for healthcare and healthcare professionals. Um, um, things are improving um, in regards to the role of nursing, but still it's um, a, a big challenge. One of the, one of the, um, one of the um, initiatives that the chief nursing officer in Europe has has um, undertaken is to bring together the chief nurses of all 53 European countries in the WHO European region as a group, and they meet regularly to discuss issues. So I think that is something that will really help. So leadership. So I think, um, again, are we all talking about the same thing? And I think there's a, a prevailing attitude that perhaps leaders are um, born. And as you can see, so you've got yourself a leader. Um, but I think 
more and more evidence suggests that this is not really the case and that many people can actually learn to be leaders. It's not something that people um, would, you know, you're not born a leader, you can develop the skills. And that's something, again, through education and training and support, we can learn to be leaders and we get better through training. And there is a lot of evidence to support that. But how do we become really good leaders? And I think, um, if you look at this, so first of all, you have to look at yourself. So um, if you feel that you, you know, do you manage your time well? Are you a leader in your clinical area? Um, do, can you respond to change? Are you flexible? And uh, do you, can you manage your composure? Do you think before you respond? Um, and, and do you um, promote yourself as well? That's something that I think is quite difficult to do sometimes, that you, you have real conviction and confidence in yourself and that comes across. And do you have support systems that you use regularly that you can that can help you to develop these um, management of yourself? And I think many nurse course, nursing courses now and post um, qualification courses would focus on developing leaders. I think it's become something that's much more prevalent. So do you help to develop other people? I have this saying that I think sometimes in nursing, we can be very critical of our colleagues and of ourselves. And, and sometimes when we get a promotion, we we don't encourage others to come up the ladder behind us and we pull the ladder up and say, well, I'm OK. But actually, as nurses, as women, as a community, as, as predominantly women, we should really be looking at how we can help our colleagues to develop, too. So do you respond to your team members needs? Do you um, listen? I think listening is huge. And we learn these skills as a nurse with patient and family interaction but we need to have it with our colleagues too and we need to be supportive and responsive do we motivate our colleagues do you stand up if you think something's wrong or do you just stay quiet um do you you know look at your team's strengths and passions and and you know we all work in teams so if you're providing nursing care and you have a team you can you know you should know your team's strengths and play to those um do you have blind spots and unconscious unconscious biases and they could be anything you know they can be as part of who you are or the way your culture but we really we really have to learn to be much more open to all of our colleagues does your behavior inspire trust in others so um you know if you're talking about one of your colleagues to to another colleague then they're not going to trust you so i think we have to be professional and we have to help each other along the way so assessing your team's performance, is this something we do as well? So does what your team doing feed into the long term goals of your organization? Do you know what the long term goals of your organization are? Are they realistic? Is there some way you can impact or influence those? Um, can you get the resources you need and the support networks you need? And sometimes in palliative care, as nurses, we deal with some very, very traumatic and difficult situations. And it's about how we respond to those and how we provide support for each other. Um, do you adjust your goals if you need to? And that's being flexible and responsive. Um, so you have a plan, but sometimes we know life gets in the way and you have to reorganize your plans. And can you do that? Um, and, and are you happy to lead? And if you're very confident and you know what your organization does, can you lead on those things? So I took this from this website, but I think these really make, it's a little summary, I think, of what leadership skills we need. So self-awareness, look in the mirror, am I a leader? Um, even if you're with a small team of people, are you a leader? Are the things, do you use your knowledge to the best ability, of your ability? And are you aware of your gaps and what you don't see and what you don't know? Do you communicate well? In palliative care, we think we do all the time. As a palliative care nurse, we're taught about active listening, not feeling uncomfortable with pauses in conversations, but do we afford the same to our team members and our colleagues? Do we listen to what people are saying to us? And do we communicate effectively without emotion sometimes? I think that that can get in the way. 
can we influence? We can all influence, regardless of your position. We can influence the way patients and their families respond. We can influence our colleagues. We can influence our managers if it's done in the right way. And I think we have to be able to learn and learn new skills and be quick at learning those. And, and seeing a situation and being able to respond, I think, is a really key thing for leadership. So what's the difference between being a leader and a manager? Surely if you're given a manager post, that means you are a leader. I think we all probably have worked with people who are managers, but are not leaders. I think the very classic line here is, if you're a leader, people want to follow you. If you're a manager, then maybe you're maybe just in a, a the, the name manager. So Naya says the difference between management and leadership is that managers control a group of set of entities to accomplish a goal. So goal focused um, and don't think about the people they're going along with, but just want to get to the end and get that and reach their goals. Whereas leadership is about influencing people, motivating them, being an inspiration um, and it's different from being a manager. A manager can be a leader too, and that's what you aspire to and you hope for. But it's not about power and control. It's about dialogue and narrative, including people in decision making rather than just making decisions that and, and um, imposing those. It's about bringing the team along the road with you as well. So I think that's something that we really should be uh, aiming towards and I think many people in palliative care do do that and I think that's um, to our credit so um, we turn to one of the great philosophers of our time so according to Oprah Winfrey who I love um, the greatest leaders inspire and empower others and show empathy and compassion but if you took out the greatest leaders and put in there the greatest palliative care nurses inspire and empower others show empathy and compassion I I think, you know, if we if we're really good at our art and we are really good palliative care nurses, that what that is what we do every day. So I think, you know, in our own way, we are leaders. So um, when I was doing a management uh, course, so this this I read this book. So this lady worked in the tech in industry. Some of you may have read this book and her name is Cheryl Sandberg. And she worked in a completely male oriented world. And one of the things she says in this book um, which I think is kind of true, is that sometimes we can be our own worst enemies as women. And as I said, 90% of people working as nurses are women. And in this, she gives a very good example of where if a man and a woman are asked about their um, list of essential uh, criteria for a job, men may well look at it and say, well, I did that once, so I've got that, or I did that, but... As women, we're far more self-critical and less self-promoting. And we would say, oh, no, I don't think I've got that. So it really is about believing in yourself and having the confidence as well and moving forward. I think that's really important. So um, another little quote. So when you can marry leadership skills and a clinical background, as we as nurses can, you have the opportunity to lead in a very distinct and different way. And I think in palliative care, we demonstrate this really clearly that, you know, we we lead and we manage our caseloads. If you're working um as a community nurse, you have a caseload, you're leading and you're managing that whole experience for the patients and their families, feeding back into your team. So whatever we're doing, I think it's a really, we're really powerful in our own way. And I think um, it's, we have this opportunity, but I think we need to believe in ourselves a little more. So if I marry all three, so palliative care, nursing and leadership, um, I, I think that really is a powerful combination. And it kind of brought me onto this. So I love a slide of the founders of the modern hospice movement. So Dame Cicely Saunders um, was a leader in palliative care. So she started her life as a nurse and then she was a social worker and then she became a physician and she worked at St. Christopher's Hospice and she developed palliative care. And she was a sort of one woman multidisciplinary team. She realized it's, it's not a unidisciplinary specialty. We need to have a combination of people looking after patients and their families in order for them all to, to meet all their needs or as many of their needs as we can and to improve their quality of life. So I think that's a really important 
I think she she's almost um, a lesson for all of us. And I know from being in Asia Pacific, they have their own, um, Rosalie Shaw is their own uh, Dame Sicily. There's a Dame Sicily everywhere. This is an inspirational person who has led. And as I, um, sorry, just check the time that I'm not too, talking too much. Uh, um, so, uh, and as, um, and on my different trips and 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 visits around um, different palliative care services, you often see that there are people who are not always physicians, but they are real leaders and have developed services from very, very low points because of their drive and their, and bringing people along and, influencing and impacting on policymakers and have really developed services. And I think many of us know people today who are still doing that and, and still driving services forward. So palliative care team leadership is about empowering all members of the team. So Dame Cicely was a one woman multidisciplinary team, but she had a big team around her at St. Christopher's who helped her to develop this whole concept of palliative care and total pain and all of the other things that she developed. So we can see a successful leader in palliative care team means leading other team members. And you can do that from all sorts of positions in the team. So I also think it's, you know, strong leadership and quality reach of palliative care and end of life care. That's how it all changes. And that's what I'm talking about, about these inspirational leaders and that we really need to think about if we could bottle what they have and keep it, that would be great. And, and that's, you know, some of the things that um, leadership is really, uh, I think for me, I, I can remember through my career, and I'm sure all of you can, the people who inspired us and we thought, oh, she's really good. I'd like to be like that. And I think, you know, it's having those role models as well within your team that's really important. No talk on nursing would be complete if we didn't mention Florence Nightingale. Um, and I'm pretty sure everyone on the call will know who she was, but she's a very famous British nurse. And even during her tenure as a nurse, so she died in 1910, she still said we should never consider ourselves finished, that we need to keep learning all of our lives. And I think it's going back to the slide earlier that said that leadership is something we can learn. And I think this is something that we should be aspiring to. And that is part of nursing and how we will develop and how we will lead healthcare services into the future. There's there's many reports about the crisis in, in health workforce. There was a report last year from the WHO European office, and it was very stark reading about, you know, retirement of GPs and doctors working in various fields. And it's not just in Western Europe. So we need to bring people through. We need to develop the next generation of leaders. And um, I think that's something that we really shouldn't overlook. So opportunities. So we have the skills and the competencies, competencies to lead. We know that because in our, in, in our education and training as nurses and in our everyday clinical work, we know we need these skills and competencies. So it's important that we can use those and use them to, to improve things for the patient and family. But also, I guess, having opportunities for career progression and being able to, you know, apply for leadership posts, for example, is a really motivating force for many people. And I appreciate that's not always the case in every country. And that in some countries, there is no higher hierarchical structure or career progression and path for nurses but it's something that we need to aspire to um nurses spend the most of the time with the patients and know them best so let's give people evidence we know this so nurse researchers let's give people evidence going back to the house model that's where we build our foundations we need to have education and training and be competent and confident and i think this is something we suffer from sometimes and i generalize in many of the things i've said but education and training i think we're, we're many of us really, really feel we know the answers to things, but we need the competence and confidence to uh, to advocate and go ahead and promote those things. So I think in, in some of the uh, eastern part of the region of the European um, WHO region and in Central Asia, it's quite difficult to, for example, access strong opioids. But as palliative care professionals, we know that's what we need. But it, it's we've seen it happen in many other countries and 
it's sometimes a long process, but to advocate for our patients and to have the knowledge and the confidence to be able to say, we know what people need is really important. Um, we need to reflect and have self-belief and think about ourselves and how we are as leaders. And are we comfortable and confident in that role? And I think that's something that's um, uh, that I think we all need to do anyway, in whatever role we're in. So um, Frank Ferris is a palliative care physician from the States, and he developed a leadership initiative to grow uh, global leaders in palliative care. And he continues to work in leadership. In fact, he and I recently wrote a chapter for the next textbook of uh, palliative medicine from Springer. And um, he, he this course that he ran I, I I was all like in awe of him anyway, but I arrived in a country in Eastern Europe and um, a doctor arrived at the meeting with a certificate from this course. He said, I did the leadership course. I know what palliative care is and I know what I have to do. So I think education on leadership is really important. And I think we need to think about how we develop our next generation of leaders. Um, and then it's just an editorial on nurse leadership. So my final thoughts are that um, I think that we're all leaders. I'm just showing you a picture of me in my nurse's uniform. Um, I, I like to put a picture of myself in a, in a presentation that has Florence Nightingale and Cicely Saunders in it. So uh, I'm, I'm joking. But anyway, um, my final thoughts are that we can all be leaders you can see. So if we are working in palliative care, we have great communication skills. We need to develop our self-awareness. We need to recognize ourselves as leaders and we need to start small. If you can't change the world, then start with something small, develop a policy, do a journal club. Think about how you as a nurse can help your colleagues to develop in palliative care. And I think that we really, it's very, very powerful if we can move things forward um, and be respected as nurses, as professionals and, um, that's it really so i'm a little bit ahead of time but i'd just like to say thank you if any of you want to contact me please feel free you can write down my e my um, email address and i'll be happy to take any questions so thank you very much thank you so very much dr ling this is really inspiring and this is a fantastic picture I have a couple of questions on my side while we're still waiting for the questions in the chat. Feel free to ask the questions in the Q&A section or in the chat. We'll be happy to answer, or at least we'll give it a try. Once again, thank you very much. The question on my side. Feels like what you're speaking about is, is a unique and a very fantastic set of competences and skills, as if these people who possess those, they are like, aliens or extraterrestrials you know but thank you very much for actually giving us an example that that's possible that this is not something unachievable and thank you very much for giving us examples and also for telling that oh you cannot just be born a leader you always become a leader you were born a leader or you learned to be a leader can you share a few words about how your leadership path was structured so i i actually um recently because i'm of a certain age got invited back to the cancer hospital where i did an oncology nursing course and they asked me to reflect on how i got from being a, an oncology nurse to where i am now that kind of almost um intimates that this that i'm at some lofty position i'm not i'm a normal person i'm a nurse and i i just think but what i would say to anybody who wants to be who wants to progress is that you should always try and run education alongside your clinical experience. Education is the key to everything. If you, if you're say, for example, some of the people I meet are working in a country where opioids are not available. And they say unto me, we can't get them. We don't know how to manage this. We don't know this. But Often when I arrive in a country with the WHO, I meet with the Ministry of Health and they say, oh, yes, you can get opioids. But the, there's this gap. So I think it's almost about making people realize that the gap is there and thinking about how that happens and to have the confidence to say and speak to people in higher positions and perhaps try and make change. I think you need to feel the most confident you can be and doing courses or so paste 
I think, you know, you maybe start a leadership program. There are leadership programs out there. There is another one that many people in Europe went through from OIPCA, which was um, part of the European uh, Palliative Care Leadership Program. And what I see from people doing that program is how many people actually progressed into positions because it gave them the inspiration and the network to be able to have uh, to, to and the confidence to feel they should go for a job that was, um, you know, in in a in a leadership position, and and I know it's not for everybody, but I think start on that small level. Think how how can I make a difference? Okay, so patient and family are in front of you and they tell you, well, no one communicates with me. I've got six appointments at the hospital. So, okay, why why aren't you highlighting that to your manager saying, let's put a policy in place, let's link with the hospital, try and organize it so patients can go to one, one time to the hospital and see several doctors. I think this kind of thing, all health services have these issues. So this is something you on the ground can identify as an issue. You know, if you're talking about becoming, a, you know, a, a leader, a manager, a chief nurse in your country, you need to ed have education running alongside your experience and pick a path that really interests you and you have a passion for. And I think if you if you love what you do and you have the education, who's who's going to argue with you, really? I think that's the thing. Wow, thank you very much. Well, you've opened a whole new other set of um, other questions. I think they, you've inspired some new questions. And the one we've received in the chat is exactly about the interaction between doctors and nurses. We've started speaking about that a little bit. But how do we find this right balance? Doctors are leaders, actually, you know, for sure. And they were taught to be. Uh, they have a lot of responsibilities. Yeah. And uh, how do you see this optimal equilibrium? How do you find this balance and um, between this uh, doctor's leadership and nursing leadership? And how does it work in practice? I, th I think many doctors are managers of their own caseload. I don't think many of them are leaders all the time. I think some of them are inspirational leaders, but many, the power dynamic, as we know, is built on, years and years of um you know I mean, it's always been thus so you saw the book i showed you and it said in 1966 that was published and it said doctors tell the nurses what to do but nursing has developed as a profession and maybe not in every country so i speak from um from the position where i can tell you wherever you are that if you move things forward bit by bit if you're empowered and you feel a passion you will be able to change things and you'll be able to change you're not going to change that hierarchical structure where the doctor's in charge but what you can do and i think palliative care one of the reasons as a nurse i loved palliative care is because i spent most of the time with the patient and I assessed their symptoms and I knew what was wrong. And the doctor came and saw them for five minutes, but I knew and I would be able to go to the doctor and say, this patient has got this, this and this. And I was educated and trained in palliative care. And I would say, you, you need to prescribe this, this, this and this. And because this trust develops, you become almost like a, 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 a an independent practitioner within the team. And I think you have to think about how you can get the respect of the doctors it doesn't take five minutes to change this structure. I mean, I, I my experience in the UK, in Ireland and working in a lot of Western European countries is that nurses are now, many of them, through necessity, because there aren't enough doctors, are now taking on those really, really advanced practice roles. And I think um, it may feel like it's such a big reach for many of the countries in Central Asia and Eastern Europe. I'd be interested to hear if there are uh, countries where that's possible, but I think it's something that we should be aspiring to. And, you know, I think that the fact that there's a nurse, a chief nursing officer in the WHO Euro office, and she's only been there for a few years, like things are moving, they're changing. Most of her work is in Central Asia and working with that group of chief nurses and empowering them. So if you have that top down and bottom up approach, um, if I was here in 50 years, I would really, or even 20 years, I really hope we would see a huge change. And I think we will. But again, we as nurses, leaders ourselves, have to do that and empower ourselves. 
Спасибо большое, доктор Линк. И у нас. Oh yes, thank you very much, Dr. Link. We do have some time for a couple of questions, which follow up the exact conversation that we have. We have a couple of questions about the specific steps and tools. Uh, it's always interesting about to learn about something specific. For example, we have a question from Kazakhstan, where the colleagues say they don't have a bachelor's degree for nurses, such as palliative nurse, or there are no even courses on um, nursing leadership. So how can they change the situation like that when there is no professional education in this area? You've just mentioned that there are some countries where the system is better equipped for that, some, some countries where it's not. But there are some countries where it's like a brownfield, I would say. And so what kind of steps can we take in order to support the people in these kind of countries? So I, I have been to Kazakhstan last year and I was speaking at um, a cancer conference. And I think this is this is I know it's so slow and I apologize for that. But just even the WHA resolution saying it should be included in universal health coverage and then as part of non-communicable diseases and cancer, palliative care has started to be included in many things. And so I'll speak specifically about Kazakhstan, but it may be of relevance to other countries. So where there is no national recognition of this course, I know, for example, St. Christopher's and the collaborating center, WHO collaborating center in India under Suresh Kumar runs a global course on palliative care leadership. Um, which um, they have some great lecturers. It's in, in collaboration with, with um, St. Christopher's. It's not expensive. So if you don't have it in your own country, there are so many courses out there and online courses and ways that you can develop your CV and empower yourselves to know more about palliative care. I mean, there's so, there are a lot of courses and PASTE, of course, will be a great resource because they will have them available in different languages. So I think that's um, I think that's one way of doing it. But I know um, in Kazakhstan, there is um, certainly the Kazakh National Association provides some kind of education. They have study days and um, under uh, Gulnara, um, uh, who is the, the president of that association. So there's lots of ways of getting around it. I understand it's frustrating because it's not something coming from the Kazakh government, but they also took me and showed me uh, a, a hospice, which they are developing. They're going, it's in development. So things are moving forward slowly. But again, I apologize that it is so slow. And I know someone else asked, and then I think it's not my turn to talk anymore, but I saw someone else asked in the chat about, would I recommend any courses or any online reading? And there is just so much, there really is. But I think if you want to start with yourself, I think that's where most leadership courses would start. And there's things like the Myers Briggs, Myers Briggs, and you can identify what kind of person you are, and then that will help you in interactions with people. And um, certainly, there's many, many courses out there that you can undertake on leadership uh, as a starting point. And maybe, who knows, maybe Roman will want to develop a uh, nursing leadership course as part of um, of, of PASTE. And I know, for example, that King's College and Dame Cicely Saunders Institute in London is also looking at nurse, nurse leadership programmes. So I think there's lots of opportunities. And I think also if you're from a low middle income country and finance is an issue, which I think it can be because I understand nursing salaries are not, not huge in many countries, then there are a lot of free to access courses available too. And I think, you know, if you start to do them online and then see see how far you get, but it, it's hard to do those when it's just you, I know. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Ling. And thank you for highlighting the fact that the resources are there, they're available. You of course need to take a certain effort and they're not, at easy reach or they are not in our specific country but still this access to knowledge is there and um, it's not always super expensive or super complicated so i'd like to thank you once again for your inspiring presentation for the answers to our questions and i'd like to say that when now we are moving to dr hoke 
maybe colleagues, dear colleagues, dear participants, it will get uh, even more uh, clear to you because we'll be speaking about some specific skills. And uh, I guess you need to eat an elephant piece by piece, as we say, there is the straits in English language. So we do want to develop uh, uh, step by step your competences, your skills uh, in order to become a better nurse and a leading nurse. And uh, before I uh, yield the floor to Dr. Hooker, I'd like to say that we have our social networks. And if you want to follow our news materials and publications, of course, I suggest that you subscribe to our um, social networks, any, any, anyone you like. It can be Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube or Instagram. And with greatest pleasure, I'd like to yield the floor to our expert from Finland, Dr. Hoka. The floor is yours. Please, I welcome you to share the presentation and it will be lovely to see the presentation full screen. And of course, you can switch on the mic anytime you like. I will just check that. Do you see it in full screen now? Uh, not yet, unfortunately. Not yet. What you can do is you can stop sharing the screen, switch the presentation full, full screen mode, and then restart the presentation screen sharing. Learning. You are never ready. You are always learning new things. И это прекрасно, и сейчас все работает. And this is fantastic because now it's all working. That's perfect. Thank you very much for the possibility to come here and to speak with you. So I'm Minna Hökkä and I'm from Finland and I'm a nurse and I'm an advanced practice nurse. And my clinical background is mainly from the home hospital. So I have been working at the patient's home. And I have a very rare combination now as a nurse because I have the possibility to work both in the clinical settings and the academia. And uh, I will tell you a little bit, maybe I could say that I will tell you a story about the development of competencies and services in Finland and how a nurse can uh, facilitate uh, the development and also what kind of competencies do we need. So if we start from uh, the beginning, uh, we already heard a lot of why it's need to speak about palliative care. So I don't repeat this, but what is important is that then when the need is increasing and we know that the need is increasing, we should be aware that the need of professionals with good skills in palliative care the need of them is also increasing. So we really, we really need to put focus on education and to development of our nursing skills. And if we are speaking about nurses and the role they have in palliative care, a lot of we heard already from Julie, but one thing I want to highlight from here is that in, uh, we should uh, more and more see that all nurses should have the competence to take care of our patient, uh, especially now in the COVID, we, with the COVID pandemic, we saw that the generalist level needs really competence in palliative care. So in more and more different settings, it's, it's uh, uh, highlighted and seen that the need for palliative care competencies is really uh, evident. So if you are in nursing homes or homes, hospitals, you need the skills. And when the uh, contexts are so uh, different, we also know that the nurses who provide palliative care, the need for a wide range of competencies exists. And why is education and competencies important? Of course, because it's it's one piece of the house, what we said, what Julie already showed us, but also because uh, it's a 
very major barrier to uh, improve palliative care access. If our nurses, I will say that especially nurses, because if we are living in rural areas, if we are outside the hospital, it can be that the uh, physicians see very rarely the patient. So then if our nurses don't, don't uh, recognize the patients with palliative care needs, they are not getting the care. So it's a very major barrier if we don't have the competencies. And also uh, it's a major barrier to develop palliative care if we don't have the people who can uh, provide the services. And now in this presentation, we will uh, speak more about education and training and competencies and li a little bit of the roof about the provision of palliative care. Uh, one main question many times when I'm speaking with non-palliative care colleagues, they are saying, is it no use anymore in 2024 to speak about education because we already have mandatory education for physicians and nurses and they are so uh, very restricted uh, by uh, laws what they have to learn. But I usually answer that yes, we still need to speak about education. This is uh, about from the EAPC Atlas of Palliative Care, which was published in uh, May 2019. And here you see the red little arrows, uh, and you see uh, about if you think about Finland, the education doesn't seem seems to be very good in palliative care. Uh, we didn't, we couldn't identify. Uh, mandatory courses in palliative care in more than two universities of applied sciences who are educating nurses. And we actually had just two uh, schools of medicine who had a mandatory course of palliative care. And the same situation is in many countries. So yes, I feel it's really useful to speak about education, about competencies and uh, how to develop that. So what have you done in Finland? We had a project funded by the Ministry of Social Affairs and uh, they uh, made um, an approach to uh, build a recommendation how uh, palliative care services should be provided in Finland. And I was uh, very uh, lucky to be one of the experts in this uh, project. And uh, I had the responsibility to build uh, the recommendation of competencies and education in palliative care. And when somebody asked, how can you uh, do things? How can you make impact? This was one uh, quite powerful way because uh, we were allowed to uh, write down the uh, expertise pathway, the career pathway for nurses in palliative care, the each step of uh, in this uh, report. So in a way it uh, forced a little bit our hospitals to recognize this thing. Also, we had the EDUPAL project where we developed our education and competencies and also innovative teaching methods uh, based on evidence. And uh, this is actually the cornerstone of uh, EDUPAL. Uh, you see the pyramid there. It's actually uh, the picture uh, we draw in the health ministry, what kind of provision we should have uh, for uh, to provide quality palliative care. We need basic level units where uh, actually almost all of our healthcare units are. And also we need uh, C level units where quite a few nurses are involved in this uh, because it's like not so many, many patients who need very, very uh, uh, advanced care. Most of our patients die in the basic level or A level. But if we want to build a pyramid, we really need to ensure that uh, the nurses and the physicians can uh, perform in palliative care with uh, good competencies. 
And to do that, we really need to implement the, the competencies in the undergraduate education, and we really need also specialist education. So in EDUPAL projects, we had quite a large uh, research part where we did uh, a, a lot of efforts to try to uh, find out what is the specialist level palliative care competencies, uh, including knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values, and what is the basic level palliative care competencies. So we did it together. So uh, somebody was talking about how to uh, activate physicians and how to do work together. So this project was made together. I was the lead and, and uh, the colleague Juho Lehto is a physician, our professor in palliative medicine. Uh, he acted as a project coordinator. And in the same time, we were developing the nursing education and the physician's education. So in my opinion, when we had the same goal, we had the same uh, aims and we had the same wish, it was very easy to work together and try to achieve uh, impact and change in our education uh, organizations. Because if just nurses were alone or just physicians were alone, it's not so much, but if we are together, we are so critical, big mass that uh, they listen to us. So for us, it was quite easy. And what did we do? We did competence descriptions. We had all, all I think we had almost 80 uh, participants in our uh, project teachers who were uh, working in the universities of applied sciences who are teaching nurses. So we were very lucky to have the possibility to uh, gather big national data. So we uh, built it, uh, the competence description for the basic level for nurses and also for physicians and associate nurses. And we made a systematic review and it was interesting to uh, see the results of the systematic review because actually uh, it was quite rare that somebody would be interested to look at what is the need, need in basic level or undergraduate level, level. It was more about what do we need in this context and so on. So we needed more more research. This, did, this gave no answer to us. But if you look at the, the competencies which was described in the literature, uh, this reflects a lot of uh, what Julie said, uh, that is also leadership. It's like we have to have uh, knowledge of how to collaborate with the team, how to be empathic, how to encounter patients. So, so I really think that we as palliative care nurses, we really uh, work in leadership uh, field in our everyday patient care too. We also made a national survey uh, for the professionals uh, and asked what they think are the competencies. And uh, also here you can see that uh, with this work, we got a very detailed uh, framework what we could build on in the education. And uh, the, what was interesting in the data uh, that if we uh, compare uh, the physician's framework to the nurse's framework, there were a very big difference in the specialist level. Uh, nurses, it was expected so much more from nurses working in the specialist level than from the uh, physicians. And we asked also what the patients want for the nurses. And uh, it was quite uh, uh, nice uh, answers. They want to be... Uh, that we are the person who makes me feel safe on my last voyage. I think that was very nicely said. They want us to be there uh, to have time. 
and also to interpret what the physicians say to be the advocate for the patient. And to be an advocate, it also means that we have to have skills in leadership. We also asked the same a question from our stakeholders and also asked a little bit about what is going to happen in the future. And you can find uh, these articles uh, online somewhere uh, in different papers. And if you are not finding them just and are interested, just ask, I will uh, give you these. And to develop education, we need also the view of the nursing students. And we ask the nursing students of their views of education. And what I want to highlight in this picture, I'm not going to read everything. I just want to highlight that Julie said that it, the things are changing. And I totally agree when I was reading the answers about uh, from the students they really are thinking that they they need a lot of knowledge about palliative care and they see that uh, they need uh, multidisciplinary teaching and learning they want to have uh, uh, education of decision making in palliative care so they are in a way shifting to already taking the leadership role already when they are students, or at least this is what I, I was reading from the answers. We also did some research uh, and meta-analysis of what could be the effective way of teaching. But we did a lot of research. What did we do then? We created a nurses undergraduate education. And what is of course interesting, does it have any effects Okay, we got it included in the national framework, which means that all the universities of applied sciences, they have to adapt uh, at least some of the objectives in, uh, in their education. We got the nurse postgraduate specialization. We have now a national curriculum and about 600 graduated specialists. And we uh, had a, have a national curriculum about uh, a nurses master degree APN education. And uh, we have about 70 graduates, advanced practice nurses nowadays. And what I'm also glad of from the beginning of uh, this January, uh, now it's included m as a mandatory subject in all our universities who are educating physicians. So maybe we could say that I hope at least that we made some changes uh, in the education system. And when what this picture shows you, uh, actually the EDUPAL project was a, a starting point of my PhD because I was very uh, disappointed uh, because a total failure in data collection was happening and I didn't manage to do my PhD. And then I was uh, looking at the pyramid and I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is never going to happen because we don't have the education and we don't even know what to teach the students to work in that pyramid. And then I got the idea to try to make a little bit of research about this. And I just called around different universities and different universities of applied sciences and asked them, would you be interested to apply for money with me? And then we wrote down the application together uh, with a team of, uh, we, I think we were five or six in the uh, core group. And we got uh, a little over 2 million euros uh, money to uh, develop the education. So uh, don't be disappointed if some something is not going very well. It can be a starting point to something new. And at last in 2022, uh, I also got a PhD. So, so this is also a good good thing. 
And what are we doing now? Uh, we have now the people uh, educated who can work in the pyramid. So now we got 5. million euros of money from the Ministry of Social Affairs. And we are trying to develop our uh, palliative care services so that all patients have, have access to palliative care services. And here you see our country and uh, I'm uh, the one who are in the response of the northern part of the country. So I have the most biggest area, but actually most uh, few people uh, living in the area compared to the other areas. And as you see, all the other leaders, they are physicians, but we have one who are a registered nurse. So also nurses can be leaders and develop uh, palliative care services and uh, it has gone well and what are we doing now we are uh, uh, making up the units of excellence or specialist units so that in every area we do have this and also we are uh, developing our palliative care home hospital services and home care and basic level nurses competence and children's palliative care and also development of competence. And I'm involved nationally in the development of competencies. And why is it so important to speak about nurses and competent nurses and nurses with good leadership skills? You see the part I'm in a responsibility of. If we think about Utsjoki and that we have our specialist unit who are taking care of the most severe symptoms in Oulu, it's 671 kilometers. If we put it in the map of Europe, it's the same if we would uh, drive from Netherlands to Paris and actually it's just 631, 38 kilometers. So we rely very much on strong nurses. They have to have uh, the skills to work in empathic way, but still they also need a lot of uh, uh, skills in leadership, how to work in the team, how to uh, consult, how to help other nurses. So in the everyday work for nurses, the leadership skills are very important. And this is a picture we got in the news because uh, we managed uh, at least uh, in 2023 to get a um, palliative care unit in the Northern Finland. Uh, so so they, they wanted to have an interview of me and my, my uh, colleague Eva. We are sitting in the same room and developing the services here in Finland. And the, we have not just done things in Finland, so we are trying to also work in the European level. The nurseedupal.euro project was a uh, uh, project where we combined uh, our strengths with uh, Hovest, Belgium, EAPC, and also Romania. And because one of the main uh, findings was that it's uh, a lack of uh, teachers also who can teach palliative care. So that's why we uh, made the Nurse Edupal.Euro project. We try to launch education to all, uh, all free to all teachers, how to teach palliative care. So this is everything free to use to all teachers. And we are going further because uh, this is the next step is nurse impact. Uh, we know that the courses is not enough. We also need to build up the self-efficacy, which is um, very similar than the leadership competence. So now we are going to move forward and uh, use the one we already have made and uh, made them uh, so that we can make even more impact on the development of palliative care. We started in December, so we are in the very uh, beginning. 
And uh, I really, really uh, looking forward to this project and the possibilities to work. And who is involved? Uh, we, again, there's quite the same team. We have Hovest involved and Verle and Denise are there. Then we have Hospice Casa Esperance and Nicoletta is involved in this approach. And then me from Finland and Patricia White from EAPC. And feel free and follow what we are going to do. We are, we are having the task force in the EAPC, the Innovation in Nurse Education, and we will update it uh, following the aims of impact. And the next step we are doing, we are trying to get, gather little data, uh, uh, make a survey in, in the European level. So I am very happy if some of you want to join and tell us your stories so, so that we can make the most best education possible and everything we are doing here is also a possibility for you because it will be free to all to access then we have ongoing the codia which are multidisciplinary uh, project aims also to develop education and here uh, uh, we are uh, working to uh, access uh, assessment tools. And to all, we can all have a role in advocacy. It doesn't matter what the role of you are, or you are working as in the clinical field, in academia, as a developer. And here I will, you will get these materials. So I just put here the top 10 tips for evidence-based advocacy, and you can read them and think about what can you do. So even if we are in different roles, it's we all have, in a way, also the leadership in, inside us. We have to be skilled and empathic. We have to be an expert what we do. We have to have the, the skills to consult with others. And we can also work as developers and we can advocate for palliative care in national or international level also as nurses. So thank you very much. And uh, in, I will end this with the ICN. Uh, they, they have a report, Nurses, a voice to lead nursing to the world to health. So don't, don't underestimate the power that we have, the power in numbers, in associations, in the trust and the credibility of the extraordinary nature of the work we do. Yes, we do so much, but there is more than we can do. The power and the potential for what we can do, not just for ourselves, but for the sake of the health of the planet is limitless. But we have to have organization and cohesion. And the most important thing, happy Valentine's Day. And uh, feel free to contact. If you uh, want to contact, you will fi find my email address there and my beautiful uh, animals. You see there too, the horse Royal William and my little doggies. So thank you. I will now stop the sharing. So I will see if somebody has something to ask. Dr. Hoeke, спасибо большое и отдельное спасибо за то, что вы напомнили. Dr. Hoeke, thank you so very much for reminding us about the Saint Valentine's Day. Maybe it's not that uh, everybody celebrates that day, but the fact that love is in the background of everything we do is critically important because without this fundamental factor, without love, there was nothing in this world. There would have been nothing in this world, absolutely. Thank you so very much. My question is, how many hours do you have per day? Seems like your day is not 24 hours, but it's much more because <laughs> feels like what you're doing is like it's an amazing work your visionary your creative and your impactful work like invokes nothing but respect and impressiveness so while we're waiting for the questions from our participants my dear colleagues feel free to leave your comments feel free to leave your opinions for just a couple of comments i'd like to make several announcements while we're still waiting for the questions to be aggregated 
First and foremost, you will see in the chat the link to the feedback form. You can also use the QR code. This is the feedback form that uh, gives you a chance to leave your opinion about this webinar. It's very important for us always to learn about what you think uh, about the organization, about the content, about everything. And you can just fill in this very short form. We'll be very grateful. This helps us get better. And um, another thing is I wanted to say PASTE is a non-commercial organization. That's why if you or your colleagues wants to support the organization such as PASTE, you can do that in our webpage in the contact section. Or here, again, you have a QR code. You will be super grateful if you would like to provide us with some support. Again, the uh, feedback form is in the chat. The donation link is in the chat. And I'll now move to questions. As we can see, the first question in the chat, uh, Dr. Höcker, what criteria do you use to assess how successful the educational courses are, the courses that you have developed? That's a very uh, good question. And we have used actually the ELNIC CAT. So we have collected data uh, pre and post our national uh, education. And now we are planning to uh, integrate uh, at least one PhD in the impact project. So we are trying to, uh, in, in the Nurse Edupal project, we developed a lot of different kind of uh, inter education interventions so that we could get some uh, evidence-based uh, results also for the different interventions. And actually, we are now writing a manuscript about uh, our national uh, curriculum, the specialist curriculum. So I hope we will get some data of, of the effect of the education in the near months also published or you know everybody know how slowly it is if we are public sending it in the near months it can be one year <laughs> when it's out but still we are working on it спасибо большое это действительно очень долгий процесс ну не всегда но как правило Oh, yes, we very well understand it takes a lot of time. Thank you for the question. There is one more practical question we have in the chat. What kind of textbooks or manuals can you recommend if they exist when it comes to nurse leadership? Uh, yes, on nurse leadership. Yeah, that's a very good question. I don't re really have the answer for that. I don't Maybe Julie have better answer for this <laughs> to, than me have, but I have just used the uh the uh, researches and the consensus papers there are great work already done from icn and also the american uh what is it aacn they have made a lot of consensus paper about nursing leadership and there are a lot of materials and what is better or not so good uh, i don't have that kind of opinions because i feel like what Florence Nightingale said is the truth. You can always learn of everything. But do you, Julie, have some practical handbooks, textbooks for you? No, I, I think I think because often finance is an issue and things change quite quickly. Probably the best way to get information, and often it's free because many people make their um, journal access. Uh, the articles free to access if they can that you can there's so many articles out there and if you look at a good like nurse leadership book then often the content has been written a while ago whereas if you're looking at journals and look online and and I think you can keep really up to date I think things that Mina's spoken about there so you know um like people who've published literature reviews on palliative care, nursing leadership, people who've done um, searches and looked at all of the data. I think those are the papers that will probably help you most. So I wouldn't recommend one particular textbook. Of course, there are many because, uh, and many of them contain theories that you would, you know, like uh, various theories of, of leadership and how they work. But 
I, I think you have to do what works for you and you don't want to get bogged down in multiple theories that are developed in different areas. I sometimes think as nurses, we should take things from, you know, the Harvard Business Review. Um, lots of businesses have really good leadership models, too. And a lot of the work has been done outside of nursing and we can apply those principles. But I would just use online search and I'm not promoting Google over anything else, but Google Scholar, you can get so many articles if you want to read and get the ones that are just published in the last few years and reviews are really a good way. Спасибо большое. Надеюсь, эти рекомендации будут полезными и действительно. Thank you very much. I hope these recommendations will be helpful. And I would, I should concur that Google is probably, yeah, a great assistant in many cases. Dr. Hoka, I have one more question. I guess it's going to be the last one for today. Um, you have shared with us about your experience from different positions uh, when it comes to interaction with nurses, with interaction with patients, with students, but. It's a separately interesting point for many of our questions. It's the interaction with the government, or the so-called GR, government and relations. In the very start, you said that you were lucky because you became a part of this working group and then you be started developing this project. What arguments do you use in the interaction with the officials, authorities, governmental authorities? Are there any recommendations for our colleagues that you can share how can we build this interaction with the government to make it efficient or in order to save time maybe you can say three bullet points three highlights yeah for me it was so that uh, i saw that there were no nurse background people in the work group so i just made the three highlight bullet points for myself and i took my phone and i called to the the lead of the work group that and I said to the lady that okay you have this kind of work group and you are developing the palliative services and most of the people working there are nurses so why don't you have nurses in your working group and then I put some of the facts what we have been reading or hearing today in the powerpoints and after that, she said, OK, then you can come here because you are a nurse. So it was like a push. I didn't expect that it was just uh, that it should be me there. But I was the one who spoke up that, OK, guys, this is not right. You are developing education for nurses, but you don't have nurses involved. So you cannot, if I would say to some physicians, OK, very good. There is a group of cardiologists, but we don't need you. We will develop an education for you guys. Would it be okay? Maybe not. So, so we also have to have the courage to speak up ourselves that, okay, now you are doing something which are related of my profession. Then you need me to say how it should be done because I'm, I'm the one who have the best knowledge about what we are doing ourselves. But it's, it's the tip, top 10 tips for advocacy. I really rec recommend to read them because there you see, I didn't, I haven't read them when I called the ministry, but that's why I said that I'm lucky because I was very green in that phase. And I, I said the right things. Now I would be much wiser and and... I would know what to say, but in a way I was lucky and it was a very, very nice, uh, nice lady there. And, and she said, yes, welcome and come involved. So we have to be also proactive. We cannot just wait for the possibility. I totally agree. And it's definitely one of the ways uh, how leadership implements itself. We see the messages from um, the colleagues from the Netherlands that they have developed internally and then they are sharing that in, they hope to share that in English soon. Yes, thank you very much. I think that's very helpful. And uh, perhaps if you don't, if you don't mind, I'll ask the very last question. Uh, are there any materials that you can recommend on prenatal palliative care? And I already saw that Julie wrote the answer I just oh, suggested yes, a book, which is a really good text on, on um, 
prenatal and perinatal palliative care. Um, it's a, a textbook, so it, it's excellent. But again, Google Scholar is another way yeah. to find information. And I would be very grateful if you want to send the Netherlands framework for me. You got my email address. I'm always very interested of different from different countries. So feel free. That is fantastic. Dear colleagues, unfortunately, we do need to finish. And I'd like to say just a few comments, um, make a few comments um, about the future. First and foremost, I'd like to thank our dear speakers, Dr. Ling, Dr. Höcker. Thank you very much. Your experience is truly invaluable and the path you've you've walked it's very inspiring our dear participants today i'm sure they were equally impressed and uh, it will be extremely useful thank you so much for your time and expertise and again thank you to the team of paste who has organized this webinar thank you to our interpreters today uh, Anna Akmaeva and chris Ropold. And I'd like to remind to everyone that all the materials will be shared with you in our resources, the recording as well. We have a web page that you can see in the screen. Um, we have um, social networks. And uh, of course, you have all the links in the chat. After the webinar, you will also receive the texts, the summary of our today's workshop. Maybe somebody finds it easier to read the texts in the summary and we'll forward that to the email that you've used when registering for this event and last but not least in the very end let me announce our follow-up webinars if you're interested we'll be happy to see you there on the 21st of february 10 cit time central european time we'll have the webinar devoted to developing palliative care in armenia in a moment you'll see the link and the registration link in the chat please, uh, Palliative Care in Armenia webinar is there too for you. In March, we'll have a round table again online. It's all about summarizing the experience of organizing pediatric palliative care in Georgia, in Armenia, Kazakhstan, and in other countries of presence. We don't have a specific date right now, but it's coming super shortly. And in order to follow up, uh, please subscribe to our news digest and to our newsletter and stay in touch through our social networks. We'll be super happy to stay in touch with you, of course. Thank you so very much for the time uh, and see you later.